Hey folks, welcome back to Top After. This is Chris coming to you live. Sorry about that little goofy uh, screw up there. That didn't work the way it was supposed to. Today's special feature, talking about growing up in the Belgian Congo. Let me just let you know in advance before we get started, this is not a pro or anti-colonial period show. This is a program simply about folks who grew up in the Congo relating their experiences at that time in the Belgian Congo. It's an era that's past. This is not people pining for a colonial era. This is not people promoting it. And this is nothing against the country of the Democratic Republic of Congo. That's a completely different entity. This is during the Belgian Congo period. Uh, two folks who grew up as young kids there and talk about their experiences. Nigel's going to talk to us about the time frame from 1953 to 1960. And Eric will talk to us from about 1950, almost exactly the same time frame. And uh, they're both going to join us. So I'm going to bring them in now. And these are my guests today, Erica. And, well, before I do it, before I bring him, hang on, hang on, before I bring him, uh, let me just put this up back on the screen here. So this was, um, that's an ecclesiastical map for those who don't recognize it from what was then the Belgian Congo. These are the districts broken down for church. As you can see, these aren't the provinces necessarily, but it's a pretty good map. It has a good breakdown. You can see how large the country is and how it's broken down in different places. And we're going to cover, I think that uh, Elizabethville, which is where uh, Erica grew up, uh, is in the Benedictines and Salicins. Uh, ecclesiastical district, and then the uh, Leopoldville, which is today Kinshasa, that's where the Jesuits were at, and that's where Nigel grew up. So we're going to talk to both of them in just a second. I'll bring the map up periodically and also bring up photographs from time to time. So we're going to get started with that. Let me welcome in my guest. Let me hang on a second here. Okay, I need to get rid of some things in this stream because there's way too much stuff here. There we go. All right. Hey, welcome, folks. You can go ahead and turn your mics on. All right. So how's it? Bonjour, mes amis. Bye. Hey, look at it. Nigel says hello to everybody in French, and Erica says hi in English. No, bonjour. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> well, guys, um, this is, uh, as I said, you know, we, we talked about this is just relating your experiences growing up. It's it's a different era. And um, if anyone else uh, grew up in the area, we're happy to host them later on, no matter what their ethnicity is, if they want to talk about their experiences. But but this is about your experiences growing up. And so with that, um, let's go ahead and I'll ask uh, Erica. So we're going to talk, uh, for, you were born in Katanga, is that right? That's right. Yes, in Elizabethville, which is now Lubumbashi. Um, I was born in a mission hospital in on a very hot December afternoon. Um, yeah. Was it a Friday? Just after a tropical storm. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. <laughs> well, I was born on a Friday. That's why I ask. <laughs> I think I am a Friday's child. Yes. Okay. Cool, cool beans. <laughs> And Nigel, what about yourself? Where were you born? And uh, were you born in the Congo or, or did you arrive there? No, I arrived there. I was born in Belgium in 1953 in a little town called Rosiers in Belgium. Okay. And so Erica was in Katanga, which is in the very southern part of the country, a uh, big mining area. Uh, if you see that movie, the recent movie, The Seas of Jadoville, you'll see a depiction of an Irish United Nations peacekeeping company that was left to their own devices and abandoned there and surrounded by Katanga troops, uh, loyal to Mo Moise Shombe. And you'll, you'll see that. But uh, that's the region we're talking about for Erica. You are in what today is known as Kinshasa, up, uh, which is the capital of uh, then of the Belgian Congo and today of uh, the Democratic Republic Congo. That's a very different situation. You're next to this massive, I mean, massive river. Uh, very different. Uh, I imagine the weather's probably a little bit different too because there's quite a, a, quite a geographical spread there. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, Leopoldville, or Kinshasa today. Who's going to go first? No, I'm I'll asking. I'm asking about that. Oh, then oh, then oh, I'll okay, get back okay. to Eric. I just um, we're just go. One, one of the, yeah, one of the unique features of Leopoldville or the Congo is that every afternoon you were assured of a thunderstorm. Ah. Around three o'clock, half past four, you would have a storm. So that was the Congo. Okay. Yeah, it was the same in Elizabethville. Okay, so you, you had the, lots of rain on both ends. Okay, but uh, but you're ex next to this massive river. I mean, the, the Congo River is huge. Yeah, it's it's incredibly big, huge, but, huge, huge. But at at Leopoldville or Kinshasa, what was it like there? It's it's slow flowing. There's no rapids or anything like that there. No, any further down. But where we were, it was pretty slow and it was quite wide. Um, and it all the boats came up from there. A lot of the trade mm -hmm. through the rest of Africa went through there. Well, you know, the Congo at that period. Sure. Um, but also, there's a there's a it, when we go through the photographs, one thing I'd like to say to the listeners or to the viewers is that there's a misconception about the Congo in that period, is that everybody thinks it was wild and it was like the jungle. In actual fact, it was a very, very modern city. And you'll see that when you look through the photographs. Mm -hmm. The thing is that was quite amazing is you would drive down the boulevard, which is a main street, you know what a boulevard is. And then the minute you've left the boulevard, 
you were almost in the jungle. Yeah. It was an amazing place. It wasn't as if you're driving from here, from Johannesburg, Pretoria, and it's a highway and you've got all these buildings and businesses. There it was completely different. It was very congested. You had a city, and then outside was all your villages and where the people lived, et cetera, et cetera. It's a bit different today, but that's what it was like at that point. So in Kitanga down in Elizabethville, or today Lumumbashi, uh, what was that like? Is that Was that built up at all? Was it more of a provincial small town, Erica? No, it was much the same. And also, um, I don't know if it was the same as Nacho, but we had every Sunday, uh, we had um, like an orchestra or something like that uh, playing and we'd go for walks. It was like a boulevard as well. And yeah, quite civilized. So a mission. Uh, we, oh, sorry, go ahead, Nigel. So we had the equivalent to German Umpabans, yeah, and they play the trumpet all the time. <laughs> yeah, with good music. Well, th- thank but you. But that was that was a feature. Thank you for sharing that, Sergeant Schultz. Um, <laughs> I know nothing, nothing. Yeah, it is it is on Soden, not Schultz. <laughs> but uh, Erica, so um, in Elizabethville, you were born in a mission hospital. You said, does uh, is that just coincidence? Were your parents missionaries? Um, no, but well, my mother came from uh, Belgium. She um, she did uh, nursing in Belgium, and she went down to the Congo to go and study tropical diseases. Mm-hmm. And um, I think she probably worked at this uh, little hospital. It was run by nuns. So I was probably delivered by nuns. I don't know. Um, I can't remember that part. <laughs> um, yeah, but it was... I think it was um, probably a very good little hospital. Um, very complications, and but I survived. So and your here we are. and your father was he in mining or business or? No, he got his he uh, studied in Switzerland in uh, Lausanne, and he was an accountant and a chartered accountant. And he worked for Tabak Congo. He was the account their accountant. Um, and I think he was part of the, uh, you know, the whole business um, conglomeration mm-hmm. there in uh, Elizabethville at that time, which um, Chombi was also part of. Yeah. So that, that, that era there, when you, now I know what um, Leopoldville was like. There are a lot of white folks um, living in Leopoldville. I don't know how large the white population was in Elizabethville, but was it, I mean, for you, was it normal to see lots of white folks around or was it mostly black Africans that you saw on the streets? Erica. No, it was a mixture. Okay. It was very much like South Africa is to, is now. It was a mixture. Do you have any particularly fond memories of Elizabethville? I mean, something that stands out other than this uh, Sunday concert thing you've referred to and going for walks. <laughs> well, we had a very big garden that I can remember with bananas growing and monkeys, and it was quite wild. Um, and also, my best friend was Trombie's daughter, and uh, um, I used to go and visit her regularly in there, and we would he would take us into the jungle to, I think it probably was uh, members of his family, a tribal village mm-hmm. in, the, in the jungle. And um, I was assimilated into their culture, uh, learning to interpret the jungle drums and all that. It was quite fun in those days when I first started to learn that, yeah. Well, I mean, Here, that's... Um, I- you, you left it, unfortunately, a, a very young age because of things falling apart later yeah. on. But um, were you able to or did you ever stay in touch with his daughter or, or have you been in touch with no. her? Years? And, yeah, that's what I figured because you were very young. So that's I mean, yeah. if you've been a teenager, yeah. it might have been a different story. But at that age, yeah. yeah. Wow. So rain every day. Um, was it yes. hot? Was it hot? Did you have seasons or is it pretty much standard the same year round? Was much, hot, much hot, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, just to get, I think it was just the humidity that changed, you know, with the heat as well. Um, and mosquito nets, we always had to uh, uh, have mosquito nets around our beds. Mm-hmm. And not just hanging over, but tucked un- underneath the mattress. Oh, mosquitoes are tricky little buggers. They know how to get to you if you don't have a tucked under, that's for sure. Yeah. Now, now, okay, well, since you mentioned that, obviously there, there's a reason for that. It's not simply not to be bit. It's to not get malaria. That's why people have the nets. Yeah. So, was there a lot of malaria? Do you remember malaria? Did you get it when you were a child? 
No, I didn't get it. Did you, Nigel? No, I didn't get it at all. Mm. Mm. Interesting. I, I got sunstroke. So, um, and also I became allergic to, you know, the palm trees in, in the Congo, mm -hmm. there's that little mm -hmm. white juice that comes out of it. I'm allergic to that. And I get terrible asthma attacks with that. Oh, so sure. I, have, I have to be, I have to be careful when I go down to Natal in those areas when there's palm trees and there's that white juice that comes out that attacks my chest. Well, it's nasty. I stay away from it to begin with. So allergic yeah. or not, <laughs> yeah. allergic or not. No, <laughs> yeah. Congo was a hot place. It was really a hot place, yeah. but you would work. It would work in the morning, mm -hmm. and then you would have a siesta until about. That's from our family side until about four, half past four, and then you would carry on for as long as you could after that, because uh, it was just really too hot and humid. Uh, it was yeah. terrible, a terrible. But as a kid, you didn't really know anything different. It's only once I had left the Congo and came to South Africa and went back to Belgium for a while that you realised how hot the place really is. You know? <laughs> well, I mean, exactly. I mean, it's people are like uh, adults who move to a place that's cold and they experience snow and, and sub-zero mm -hmm. temperature. Like, oh, this is terrible. And like, mm -hmm. and when you're in your kids, you're like, you're just out there playing in it, getting all soaking wet mm -hmm. and your hands are red and you're freezing and you don't pay and mm -hmm. you never mind to it. You just don't know any better. It's what you know. So yeah, I can understand. I can relate to that. Erica, when you... Uh, when your family lived there, did you did you what did you guys eat? I mean, was it, was it a, a European style diet, or were you eating local things or a mix of things? Do you recall? A mix of things, and uh, um, I, I was introduced to manioc and cassava, which I loved. Ugh. I absolutely Ugh. loved. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to eat it. <laughs> I don't even want to look at it. <laughs> Cassava, no, thank you. Mm. I don't know if I would eat that now, but as a child, I didn't mind, you know, and it was also the way they prepared it. Mm -hmm. um, when I was with Tommy's family or friends or whatever in the village, mm -hmm. um, it was a total, total different kind of diet and uh, lifestyle. And the thunderstorm at four o'clock every afternoon, which cooled down everything after that and made it a lot more bearable. Um, it would, but but now let me ask this question because Liberia was like this: it would rain, it would be brutally humid and hot. It would rain, everything would cool down, yeah, and then it would yeah. steam off, and it would get just as bad within a short period of time. Was that, <laughs> is that how it was there? Basically, yes. Yeah, and of course, we didn't have air conditioners in those days. Aircon? What's aircon? Aircon yeah, no, it, down the window. <laughs> no, you slept. You slept with your windows open, and you didn't have pajamas. So. You just slept with however you want to sleep, but uh, you were you were ninety nine point nine percent naked. Yeah, put it mildly. All right, this is the TMI uh, section of the program, folks. Uh, turn your volume down. Um, just to look the other way. Tell the children to go to the next room. No, but seriously. Uh, so, Nigel, <laughs> um, what was your family doing in the Congo? Uh, what were your parents up to down there? My my uh, my dad met my mom. Uh, just after the war, and he got mustered okay, out of the hold on, hold on, folks. Hold on, folks. Okay, for those of you wanting, no, this is not the Iraq War. No, no, this is not the Gulf War. This is not Vietnam. <laughs> this is not, not Korea. This is the yeah. war, the Second World War. Go ahead, Nigel. Yeah. He, he'd served in the Navy for for the whole period of the war. Oh, dear God, another uh, Navy guy. Jeez. Um, I will sort you out, my dear boy. <laughs> anyway, that's how my dad used to talk. Exactly. Anyway, um, yeah. I remember, just to interject here, he sent me to England because when I came here, I couldn't speak English. I only spoke French. Mm -hmm. So he sent me to England to learn to speak the Queen's English because he was very, very English, you know, And when because he was an officer in the Navy. So when I got back from the from uh, England after spending a year there at a private school or what they call um, a public school, uh, he sat me in the chair and he said, right, my boy, let me hear you speak the Queen's English. And I said, what? Anyway, having said that, um, my dad must have, I, after the Navy, he married my mother, of course, obviously. Uh, you did in those days. Um, and then he got a job with a company called IGCB, International Geographic du Congo Belge, which is a company that did aerial photography and mapping for the military and for uh, geographic purposes. And he was invited to go to the Congo to run one of the sections there, which he did. And this is how we landed up in the Congo. And um, with and his whole period of his time, we lived in the Congo. He worked for that company. So on the first picture, you'll see there. There's uh, one of the aircraft, which was uh, a De Havilland Dove, which was used uh, for aerial photography, or as a 
the thing with, with, with flying in the Congo, you don't fly late afternoons because of the storms. Right. You flew in the morning. So they had three airplanes. They had the Dove, which transported all the, the Let me put that on the screen stuff. right now. I'm going I'm to yeah. bring that on the screen of Tropos here. So just a second here. All right, there you go, folks. You can see it. That's the first aircraft mm -hmm. on there. Yeah. And that, you can see the ICGB yeah. on the side, on, mm -hmm. on the fuselage. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that transported the, the workers and uh, the members of the, of the company to the various places, Bukovu, uh, where else did we go to uh, Matadi and, and all sorts of other places. And then the main two other airplanes, which were DAX, which the old C-47s, which were converted to aircraft for, with huge cameras, which we'll get to later. Mm -hmm. um, so we traveled a lot around the Congo, but our base was Leopoldville. Okay. So that's that was his job. That's and he was head of that particular division. Now, before we go any further here, I've got it up on the screen. So it looks like the picture below that, because I've got full screen now, so two pictures up yes. each page. So yes. it looks like that might be your parents. Uh, your father was an Englishman. Uh, your mother, I'm guessing, was Belgian. How the hell did yes. you get a German surname? Please fill us in on that one. Um, that's not that is not my dad. That's oh, my mom. Sorry. Okay. That's not fine. That's my mom. The reason why I put that picture there, because that's a very well-known personality in, in South Africa, or was. Mm -hmm. His brother was. Okay. His brother was, uh, uh, um, his, this guy's name was Mike Frost. His brother was, oh gosh, it's just slipped my mind now. Anyway, he flew for the Cheetah Squadron in Korea. Ah, okay. Starting gotcha. in Spitfires and what have you. Now, this fella... Him and a few other guys started Trek Airways years, years, years ago. But he was a pilot for my dad at that period of time. So that what you see there is my mom and this uh, guy called Mike Frost. But what's interesting, if you look at the look at the furniture, yes. it's the furniture of the period. So it was all very modern for that. So this is where the illusion of the Congo being jungle all the time. It was very, very modern mm -hmm. for for its time. Anyway, that's that's what it's about. Okay, that so picture. that so that is your mother though. Yes, that's my mother. Is she yeah. is she Belgian? She's Belgian, okay. and my fa my father's British. So where the German name comes from, is yeah, I really don't know, but I'm told <laughs> we originated. <laughs> well, from, I don't know, but I'll just make uh, something up for you, Chris. <laughs> why not? Uh, from G from Germanic tribe called the Sordens or Bath Sorden or whatever that is, and that's where the name originates from. Now, there's a lot of Sordens in America and in Ireland and in England, so it's not unique. It's just that you don't hear a lot of that particular surname, and it is German. In the origin. Yeah, no, the you mentioned bot. Uh, it's spelled B-A-B, yeah. but pronounced like bat, like mm. bot. Uh, mm. Bot is is a German word for bath. Um, so like the yeah. Roman bath. So you have you have bad Kreuznach, bad mm. uh, bad Soden. Um, mm. there's, there's a lot yeah. of them. So bad Reichenhall. Those are all places that had thermal baths where um, the Romans introduced that in Germany. Uh, yeah. for the parts they controlled uh, on the other side of the Rhine. So, yeah, interesting. So uh, let's talk a little more about these photos then. So let's go to the next page. Um, and here we have a cockpit photo, and then it looks like a bombardier's position with an oxygen mask on. What's that all about? Okay, that's that's my dad. Now, if you look at the bottom, the bottom corner, the right-hand corner near the middle, that's the camera that was used to do uh, photographs, okay. just to do these huge... Huge eight by ten negatives. Sure. Um, top topography photo photography. Now he's lying on a mattress because remember this aircraft. All these aircraft at that time were turbocharged, not turbocharged, supercharged. Yeah. So they had to they had to really fly at high altitude, which was and he sees wearing an oxygen mask, which is higher than twelve and a half thousand feet. Yep. So they're flying at around twenty five thousand feet, taking photographs. He's lying on a mattress there. And if you look, he's got blankets all over him because it's bloody freezing up there. Yep. And he he guided the aircraft and where and guided the camera where the pictures had to be taken. So you see the oxygen mask there, the mattress in which he lied on, and the blankets over him. So yeah, that's what it was all about in those days. And the cockpit view there is Mike Frost flying. Um uh, the co-pilot's flying at that point, as you can see. But that was just an, a, 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 the cockpit of that era of the C-47. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, 47, C-47 Dakota, amazing aircraft. Uh, six of them, six or seven of them still in service with the South African Air Force. Mm. They had nine, yeah. but they've managed to crash three of them in the last decade under the ANC. Yeah. But uh, amazing aircraft, now 70 years old, still in the air. Uh, very mm. popular platform. There's a yeah. company, Buffalo Air, up in uh, Canada that uh, that flies these things. They had this, um, what are the uh, ice pilots or something like that? Was this uh, television mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. show? Really awesome stuff. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I actually know the the son up there, Mikey Bryan, uh, mm -hmm. who um, is now um, is going to take over from his father. But uh, yeah, no, it's uh, the C forty seven is amazing aircraft. 
this was quite uh, quite quite the setup there. Of course, for folks who are not familiar with aviation, when you go over 10,000 feet, you need to have a pressurized aircraft normally uh, because of the uh, lack of oxygen and the um, air pressure up there. So that must have been tough duty for your dad sitting in the back of this thing with that camera freezing like that. It had to be a real challenge at over 12,000 feet, I think you said it was. Yeah, yeah. He, he Just a little bit of a history about him as well, which I have later on you'll see. If you, I don't know if you want to go further down. There's a biplane in there. If you want to uh, display well, that. that far ahead, but let me jump Okay, let's one. okay, let's not let's, worry about that. You will get, get to, to it. We'll do the next one real quick yeah. and then we'll cover some okay. more things. So, okay. so the next one here looks like um there's a hangar there with I see at yeah. least four tails coming out of it. Yeah. And then uh two folks standing below one of the aircraft. Yeah. They they were aircraft engineers. They worked on the engines. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I've been told by 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 um, competent, accomplished authorities that black people weren't allowed to do anything in Africa. They were denied. Uh, How could they possibly be engineers if black people were denied education and no, couldn't do anything? No, you know, by no. the way, speaking of which, um, you know, Dr. Um, Zuele Mkizi, the South African's Minister of Health, uh, attended schools to become a medical doctor during apartheid in South Africa and mm. became a medical practitioner during apartheid in South Africa and practice medicine during apartheid in South mm. Africa. But I thought that mm. blacks were denied education, but I'm anyway, just sorry, not, not to, we're not talking politics, no. but how do, no, these no, folks, no, it's fine. how do these folks wind up being engineers? What's the deal with that? Well, the company trained them up. I mean, we didn't we didn't have segregation in the country in those days. You went, everybody went to the same school, whether you're black, white, Chinese, Indian, whatever it was. You all went to the same school. You were all taught by Jesuit priests or teachers from the Belgium, uh, from the country, the home country, we used to call it. Yeah. So they all had all the opportunities. It was all there. You know, it, it, that's my understanding. What happened politically wise, I have, yeah. I really, it's, I don't know. But it was just them standing next to the aircraft. And as you know, everybody likes to have the pictures taken next to the airplanes. And this is one of the aircraft that they worked on. And these aircraft were seconded from the Sabina and then converted into the, uh, into the uh, f photographic platform aircraft. Sabina being the, so, the state of national the main, carrier of, yeah. of, of Belgium, which eventually went Correct. bankrupt. <laughs> Correct, yeah. Yeah, so these aircraft that you see there are the actual aircraft of the company uh -huh. that were hangered in Yopoville. Um, but they flew all over. So you ha you would always have two aircraft that were um, airworthy certificateness, and then one was kept back, which was going through. It's either it's 50 hour, 100 hour, it's annual. And then the next aircraft, so they would rotate all the time. Right, we would call that phase, was a, phase maintenance. So you always had yeah, part of the yeah. aircraft going through phase. Always had an airplane yeah. up in the air, yeah. And because of the weather, and also there was a policy in the Congo, and I don't know, maybe Erica would know about this as well, that in the company, you weren't allowed to live longer than, you weren't allowed to stay longer than six months in the Congo. That was the company policy. I don't know if it was a policy amongst the, uh, the, uh, the ruling party at the time or the government at the time, is that you would uh, had to go back to Europe for six months. So you worked for six months, went back to Europe for six months, Went back to the Congo, worked for six months, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the reason was that because of because of the tropical diseases, they were worried that, you know, you stay too long, you might pick up malaria or one of the other tropical diseases. So some other photos that we'll get to later on, I'll explain to you what it's all about. Well, that, anyway, sounds, that's a, a, that sounds about as scientific as, you know, um, you can have um, 50, yeah, it's boring. 50, 50 or no, 50 or less guests at a gathering because of COVID. But if you have 51, mm -hmm. everyone will die from COVID. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, I can't remember leaving the Congo every year, uh, but I do remember going to um, Switzerland. I think I went twice. Mm. Um, also, I remember going to Mozambique on holiday. Um, I think we did that to us. Uh, the one time, actually, um, yeah, that was an interesting experience because we were in a little cottage, you know, right on the beach in Mozambique, and yeah. um, my mom was preparing breakfast and was one of these paraffin stoves, and it exploded. Oh, gosh. And, yeah, yeah, and my mom was badly burnt, and she had to be thrown to South Africa. Yeah, I'm um, sure. So, I, mm, I'm sure it's a company policy. I don't think it was the policy of a probably, government at the time. You know, probably. But now that you mention no. it, it's we did go away quite often. Yes, yeah. I, I remember we used so, to sit outside in, in certain places, which you'll see some pictures later on as well, where a helicopter would fly overhead and drop uh, DDT all the time. Do you remember no, that? I don't remember that. Yeah, that's no, a mosquito. They're controlling mosquitoes. That. Yeah. 
I was late afternoon, just before the storm. It was very effective. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it also um, weakened uh, eggshells for birds. So <laughs> yeah. we wound up, yeah, because of Rachel yeah. Carson's Silent Spring, we stopped mm-hmm. using it. And, um, mm-hmm. and the way they were using it was indiscriminate, but um, judicious use of it was quite. But anyway, that's another story. But uh, So that raised a question uh, when you mentioned your, your mom. So one thing I noticed when I started traveling in Africa it was still prevalent that it continued since the colonial era is that people who lived in uh, Africa outside South Africa and from you know the Congo downwards, if they needed serious medical care, they always went to South Africa for their medical care. Was that a phenomenon at the time for you guys as well? Uh, people were being evacuated or did you get most care you needed right there in Leopoldville or Elizabethville? No, we, we got care there, but I, I, if you really were sick, then we went to Belgium, because it's a government. In, it was a government company. Um, we were all that was taken care of by the government. So if you really got sick, we were shipped off to to Belgium to 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 Brussels, and then we went to the national health there at the time. So it was it was that was that was. I'm getting tongue tied here. That was the policy in those days. You know, well, I ask um, because and I'm, kind one of, t- I'm kind of picturing, you know, maybe there's a big hospital in Stanleyville, and maybe oh, there, there was, yeah, you know, mm. and but then uh, maybe in Elizabethville there might be a hospital, maybe there's a bunch of little clinics, and I'm just trying to picture this. I'm thinking if you need like a heart surgery or something like that, you'd have to go. No, there no, no. I think I think yeah. the, the, the I think they would do like appendix mm-hmm. if it was that bad, but I think above serious stuff, I think they would send you somewhere else. But we never went to South Africa. We went back to Belgium many times. And every six months you had to go. We had my dad and I was tested as well because I, I remember that one specific incident when we had to be tested uh, for diseases and what have you. And then I got a shot for, um, it was something I can't remember, but they gave it underneath my foot, some vaccine. Mm-hmm. And I got terribly sick over it. So um, I landed up in a hospital in Belgium because of that. So, Erica, what about with you guys? Uh, serious things you were evacuated to South Africa, or? Well, my mother was evacuated to South Africa when she was with uh, with that service, service. and um, um, she was uh, flown down by helicopter, I and mean, I we followed her back to an orphanage. It was about a year before we we came down to South Africa as refugees. Gotcha. So I was must have been about four. Yeah. Okay. So Ron is asking a question. Um, I'm going to try to do this. So uh, <laughs> I, I assume that this means mother. Murder? Is murder mother? M-O-E? Murder. Yeah, okay. So he's asking Nigel, I think if you're, now this is in is in, is in Flemish, I guess. I can't tell, but he says, Flams, Vals of Brussels, a Flemish Walloon. Okay, yeah, that I can read. Flemish Walloon or Brus, uh, from Brussois. Where's your mother from, if you don't mind sharing? He was curious. She's she's a Walloon. A Walloon. Okay, there you go. Okay. She's from Brussels. Ah. Yeah, but uh, she's a Walloon. She's a Walloon. Okay, cool. Well, there you go. Same as my mother. I just let you know, uh, Ron. We're not ignoring you. Just having a hard time. Fa- I'm a hard time figuring out what you're trying to ask. I think I got it. Okay, <laughs> so let's go back to the photos real quick there, and uh, the ones I'm gonna put on the screen now are the next ones, which is one of those engineers with a massive engine there, mm. and then mm. below that, uh, people gathered in a living room for conversation. What are these mm. two photos? Tell us about those, Nigel. These again, I, I can't remember exactly where they were, but this. Is is what would happen when you weren't flying. You would gather around and then discuss whatever events or the daily life in the Congo, because it was pretty laid back in many instances. Some days you couldn't fly. Some months you couldn't fly at all because it was just too hot or humid. So this was just a general type of get together around there and drink a, a consumer, an ordinance amount of beer, which I didn't. <laughs> I drank an ordinance amount of Coke. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is what they would do. And um that was our daily life. That's what it was all about. Just sitting around, talking nonsense and whatever you, carefree. I'm thinking that maybe uh, Dodgy Joe and um, and uh, Yanni have it right. I mean, Call of Duty looks a lot more interesting than sitting around drinking. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So what's the, uh, the the engineer that's here? Is that an engine from one of the Dakotas? Yeah, that's a Pratt & Whitney. I don't know exactly which one it is, but it's one of the engineers. One of the engines have to take off the aircraft, probably doing some maintenance on it or whatever. I'm not too sure. But um, they, I mean, if, if you look at, just look at the guy. I mean, look at what he's got. I mean, you know, it's, they were reliable. They worked. My dad always praised them. Mm-hmm. Uh, never had problems with them. Um, they always were eager. Mm-hmm. They flew with us. Um, 
you know, it was all very much a mixed bag. You know, no problem at all. No problem at all. That's quite the impressive engine he's working on there. So let me slide mm. down. I've, I've changed the view because it was too small okay. to full screen. So what mm. I've done now is on the next page, um, I'm going to guess this might be your mom and maybe you sitting in a park bench. That's exactly it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> look, look at little <laughs> Nigel. Look at <laughs> Nigel. He's like the brew. Little... He's, he's showing off his nipples. <laughs> That's little me. Little me. Wow. Anyway, um, yes, again, um, I, what I wanted to show here, why I chose this photograph, is that if you look at the park, it's just a normal scene. There's nothing fancy about it. It was a well-kept park. There was strewn all over in Yopalville. You could walk around. Um, it was just nice and comfortable. But if you notice, that I'm not wearing anything. That's how you walked around in the Congo, because it was hot as hell. <laughs> so, and the clothes, my mom at the time made all her own clothes. So she would, uh, she brought a, a sewing machine. I know that because she used to talk about it, uh -huh. how she used to enjoy making clothes. Um, and of course, my dad, being not only a photographer, he would take a whole lot of pictures. So, like I said, we've got thousands of pictures of that period. But I, I specifically took this one because of the park. You know, you could go there and sit and do whatever you want to, I guess. You know, That's pretty cool. Now, the, the, the bench, the, uh, the frame of the bench is concrete. Mm. It looks mm. like the slats might be metal. I can't tell if they're metal or wood. Um, they would. They were wood. Oh, they are wood. Okay, okay. Wasn't yeah, sure. I was yeah. wondering if maybe termites yeah. might be an issue. <laughs> no, no. You know, the little red ants were an issue. They used to bite the crap out of you. Yeah. You know, you had to be careful for those red ants. You know, they, you would uh, scratch in places where you didn't want to scratch. <laughs> Yeah, I know they, uh, they. Somebody got the genius idea to import these uh, these red ants that keep the forest floor clean from Germany into the Pacific Northwest. If you go out there in this Washington State and you're walking around and and you sit down, uh, if you're not careful, you'll get bit pretty badly. These things they bite and they leave marks and they're huge and they're very painful. Um, mm -hmm. But they the forest floors are quite clean because they they're, mm -hmm. they're great scavengers. They keep it clean. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a lovely photo of the park there. Um, you must have been. I don't know, 18 months, two years old at that yeah, stage? Yeah, around, around there. It was early, early 53. Okay. 53, 54, early. Um, just probably just gotten there. Um, I can't tell you much more than that. All I wanted to do was de depict what the parks looked like at the time period sure, and the, sure. the life of people, um, how they lived there and what they did for fun. And, you know, we didn't go to cinemas. Yeah. You know, we didn't go to pubs. What we did do is that, you know, Belgium is, fa is famous for its little road cafe sites, the yes. little restaurants where if you, if you go to La Grand Place in Belgium uh, around the square, on the one end, you've got all these little restaurants with the chairs and what have you outside. And you would sit there and have your little whatever it is you'd like to drink. And it was very much like that in the Congo as well. You would go on the boulevard and you'd have all these little restaurants on the side with their chairs and you'd all go there and drink under an umbrella that had uh, Schmernoff on it. What was the name that they used to use on those things? I can't remember, but anyway. So, so that's, that was the life in the Congo. Hendo is being a little cheeky here and I'll practice my Afrikaans. I think what he's saying is that Nigel was a, a naked colonial. Uh, Nigel was a Kalgat <laughs> colony. <laughs> yeah, pr probably, you know. But I have no tattoos, yeah, my, so I don't know. <laughs> but my brothers, so they ran around naked, and my one brother, my older brother, um, he was everywhere. My mom, she had us three children very close together, and uh, my older brother was middle child, and he was eventually um, she had put a miniature cowbell around his neck. So that she always knew who he was because he was into everything. And the one time she had these guests who came from And uh, apparently my brother came running around the corner as brown as it, he, he had dirt all over him, as naked as he, he, uh, as they were born, with the bell ringing around his neck. <laughs> <It's a combo. laughs> But I'll give, I'll give you a typical scene, which is what I remember, because, it, you know, there, there are moments, there are nanoseconds of time when you lived in the Congo that are imprinted in your mind and you never forget them uh, because they were just pure joy. Um, one of them is that I used to have little monkeys as pets. Uh -huh. Now, in them days, if you think of spa, where we have a, a shopping, um, a, a, a franchise of shops called spa, where you go and buy baked beans and God knows what it is you want. But they had something similar there. 
And what they used to do is used to pack all the baked beans and the cans of fruit or whatever on the floor. So you would have a, a stack of baked, baked beans, you know, stacked up in tins. And I, used, and I used to go to shops quite often. And that's one thing you could do in the Congo. You would yeah. walk around there quite safely, no problem. So I had this little monkey on me, and, and he was such a naughty little bugger that I went into one of these shops the one day, and he pulled one of these cans out that I had to run away as a five-year-old, you know, because my monkey, my monkey had done something terrible, you know. <laughs> Fortunately, I was not chased by a dog. So, um, yeah, and those, those were the scenes that, that happened there often. You know, you would, it's not that everything was perfect. It's just that um, you were just a normal person. However, you can't walk around here now doing that sort of thing, uh, where there you could. Um, and everybody just took it for granted. There was nothing, you know, there was no murders. There was no kidnapping. Uh, sorry, let me put that. There was murders, but it was not in the extent that we have now. There was no kidnapping and that sort of stuff. It was just pure relaxation, enjoying a life. And I'm sure, I mean, for me, as a kid, I'm sure my parents had anxiety over certain things. I'm sure they had. Um, but for us as kids, it was just a brilliant, brilliant way of life. So much so when I landed up in Joburg and I got off the aeroplane, I looked at my mom and I said, Alors, c'est pas du Congo, eh? Qu'est-ce qu'il y a ici? C'est un problème, eh? I don't know if you can translate that, you know. I, um, you know, it wasn't the Congo for me. Hey? It's, it wasn't the same. Mm. No, I think and that and was we should same. share with with the audience is that, of course, that we're we're talking about recollections of folks who were young children at the time. Your your experience mm. as a child. So, mm. as children, we seldom know what's going on with our parents or socio political mm. issues. Those really mm. aren't things. Mm. You know what you experience, like you know me going mm. and living in a in a housing complex that was entirely black, uh, four hundred families, mm. just three white families just natural that's just how things were it's not you know something you thought about a question my best friend was black because everybody in the neighborhood was black so you know it's just how it was so erica these cafes were they a common feature in elizabethville as well um these little you know belgian coffee cafes you find on the side of the road yes they were they were of course i will always remember the bank that you know that play in the bank your your microphone bank. is getting hollow again did it move or something yeah. There we Thanks go. to the bottom. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry. They, um, yeah, so they were. Um, I remember going for ice cream quite regularly and that type of thing, just to cool down probably also for my mom. Um, but obviously my most memorable memories were the bands and the bandstand and uh, families gathering in the streets. And um, it was very carefree. And even the school was interesting uh, because we, I don't know about Nigel, I started school at about the age of four. Same here. And uh, yeah. And uh, Sanford, huge Sanford, but everything was big to me then. Um, and it was a Flemish school. So uh, with my mom being Flemish, um, it wasn't a problem um, at all. And that's where I met uh, Tommy's daughter was mm -hmm. at the school. And yeah. that was all, of course, the language instruction was French, of course. Flemish. Flemish and French. Oh, in Flemish as well. Okay, that's interesting. That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. Because yeah. these days, um, normally when kids are living abroad in a remote location like that, if there's, um, although there it was in international schools because that was actually, it was, it was Belgian. Um, but yeah. uh, say if you send your kids to a, a school abroad these days, typically the international schools are done in English, whatever country. And so I'm just curious. Brett is just giving a super chat. He's asking your thoughts on Patrice Lumumba. Um, she was a small girl, probably never heard of Patrice Lumumba. Um, probably doesn't know much yeah. about him all that time. So we're reflecting on this time period, Brett. So you can ask that question at a later stage. But thank you for the super chat. So, Nigel, um, were you taught in French? I was, I was taught in French, yeah. Um, we never spoken to in Flemish. So I was purely French. And, and, and I had a, we had a nanny mm -hmm. who was a caretaker for me personally. And she used to take me to the market. There's a picture of a market somewhere there, which we'll get to. Mm -hmm. And she would teach me Swahili. So I learned Ooh. to speak Swahili. Okay. Uh, cool. when I was, and unfortunately, I've forgotten it when I came to. No, the, but Swahili's the, easy. You know, it's uh, I, mm. I I I learned it. I was fluent in it uh, in mm. less than a year at university, and then I didn't mm. speak it for over twenty years. Found myself mm. in Arusha. I was sitting in a cafe, mm. and people around me in this this hotel there for a conference. And some people were speaking Swahili. I wasn't really paying much attention. Others were speaking English. The waiter came and asked me in English. He said, "Would you like something to drink?" And I didn't even think about it. it. Just came right out of my head. Anina Tokamaji. 
where'd that come from? Uh, I'll have water. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, that means I'll take water. But uh, yeah, it just came out. So it's a fun language. But but listen, mm -hmm. you've you've done very well in life despite the handicap of having been educated in French. I mean, you've overcome that disadvantage. <laughs> <laughs> No I can I can th I can thank my father for that because when I married my wife she was Afrikaans and I was at that then I could speak English so when I met her she could hardly speak English and I and I couldn't speak Afrikaans so when we first dated she I would say kiss kiss and she looked at me and she says young moor and I thought oh that says yes I would give her a kiss you know <laughs> anyway okay that's that's, that's the same th that's the same with French you know you would. I would come here because I didn't speak English at that time, yes. or very, very broken English. And it was very difficult for me. And of course, one of the misconceptions is that if you came from the Congo, everybody thought you were you could speak Flams, which is not the case at all. Right, right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. That That's why I asked those questions. So mm -hmm. interesting. So um, there is a question in that in the chat here about um, if, if either of you spoke uh, Lingala. No. Yeah, no. uh, that's. I wouldn't expect that uh, we'd get that from America because it's not the right region. But for you, it might be something you might have heard. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so let's get back to the photos. Let's take a look at those. Now, this one here, um, this looks to be like a pram from the 12th century. Um, it's a little outdated here, um, and uh, I'm going to guess that's you with your mom. It is with my mom, but you can brush her aside and me for a while. What I want you to do is have a look at the background and look at that building. Well, that's, that's, what, kind of... that's, that's what I was going to talk about. This looks yeah. like a major metropolitan city yes. somewhere in Europe. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, it was very modern. There was high rise, what we used, what we call high rise buildings, but it's a block of flats. You see, if you go and look at pictures of the Congo now, especially uh, the Opova, which is now um, Kinshasa. Kinshasa you will see a lot of these still exist and people live there. So it is very modern, very much metropolitan. Um, so the misconception that the Congo was wild and it was bush all the time is not true. However, having said that, there was nothing more enjoyable than getting into a four by four. And then 20 minutes, you're out in the jungle or in the country hunting, you know, doing crocodile hunting in a cutout canoe or, you know, looking at wild animals, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that was the contrast between a city and going out to what we call here yeah, the bush felt into the felt. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's it's important to dispel those myths. There's, you know, this mm. is part of the problem. And so let me let me just very clear about this. It's interesting because um, what you find is that um, when you I've seen this many times. I've seen people uh, when they when they come from Africa or they come from Asia or something like they talk to Americans and especially American kids and like oh they're just racist. What? Well, they think everyone you know has monkeys and mm. elephants in the yard and everything. But uh, immigrants whose kids come from Africa and grow up in the West and are disconnected from nature in Africa, mm -hmm. uh, who happen to be black, um, ask the same innocent questions as young white kids. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you have elephants in your yard? Do you have, you know, because they don't know any better. It has nothing to do with that. that that's what mm -hmm. always irritated me about this mm -hmm. sort of thing is that people have these conceptions and, and misconceptions about locations. And you guys are helping to dispel some of those. Well, here, let's talk to the next one here. Uh, this looks like um, an awesome looking folded wing biplane with a torpedo on it. And okay. um, there's a gentleman at the top. Okay, that's my dad. Okay. The one on the top is my dad. Okay. So this is a beach scene. And as you can see, we have a little transistor radio, and he's trying to fish. And my dad was not a fisherman, but he was he was um, sort of um, cornered into trying to catch fish, which we tried. Um, but that's my dad, just to give you an idea of what it looked like. This the, the scenery at that at that point. It could be anywhere in South Africa, in actual fact. It could be yeah. I don't know, whatever. But the plane below uh, the the biplane. That's a swordfish. That's a um, a swordfish that my dad served in. And one of the interesting facts about uh, my father is that he was on the ship that, uh, one they call a ship, I'm referring to the airplane, he served on the HMS Ark Royal. And he was on one of these aircraft that uh, was engaged, uh, that engaged the Bismarck. Ah, okay. Yep. He was in the second wave. And that's why I put it in there. So that's part of the history of my family. Now, interesting thing about this photo that I must note here is that I do see that the engine is running because the propellers are spinning. Yet I don't see any pilots in the aircraft. <laughs> um, you have a good point there, actually. I've never noticed that. <laughs> I see a pilot on the right side oh. of the image walking like, hey, yeah. my plane's taking off without me. <laughs> <laughs> you have a good point there. I've never noticed that. <laughs> That's hilarious. Oh, uh, yeah. Goodness. Wow. 
Wow, but the Bismarck, yeah, quite, quite a piece of history there. Mm. Um, okay, we're going to go down and look at another photo here. Um, I'm going to guess that's your mom with, I don't know if that's booze or cologne. It looks like that's, it might be cologne. That's that's booze. <laughs> okay, it's booze. That's a lot of booze. <laughs> so if you, yeah, that's my mom in one of her black hair periods. Um, now, if you look at the, the top of the the booze counter or the bar, yes. you notice this, that one of the things that a lot of the, the Congo people did is that we would burn candles yeah, on I bottles. Yeah, I see that. That's like eight pounds okay. of candle wax on top of that yeah. bottle. And we had, a, we had a collection of those. And the one day our uh, keeper came along and cleaned all the bottles. And it threw my mom in a complete spin. She said, do you know how long it took me to have this done? And, blah, and she didn't that. And you said, well, I was just trying to clean up. Yeah, you know, exactly. so it was quite funny. But uh, I mean, again, again, I just want, you know, folks to, to take a notice. You know, they, they used to, unfortunately, do drink a lot, but they have a little mixes, you know, they would mix. I don't know. I'm not a drinker, so I wouldn't know. Maybe a bit of brandy with some hot pepper in it or something. I have no idea. And of course, you can see there are international people because they smoke in Peter Stuyvesant. I was about to say, if you, you take know? a look at the table, you also notice a different error. <laughs> there are smokes on the bar as well. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And um, but just the whole scenario of the Congo, it's not a it's not a bush cabin or anything. Yep. Actually, in fact, it's quite luxurious. We never owned a home in the Congo. We never owned houses per se. Right. It's because because with the government, the government had houses all over the place. So we would we wouldn't even have to pay rent. Mm -hmm. All the furniture was ours, uh, you know, the, the folks. Sure. And we would just furnish the house. Um, so that just gives you an idea. And the dress my mom's wearing, she made it herself. Mm -hmm. So that just gives you an idea of the lifestyle of that period. Well, on this next photograph of, I've slid down mm, to, this is a city mm. scene. It looks like quite a wide boulevard there with a, a big uh, centerpiece with, uh, it looks like a little yes. monument or yes. park there, bushes and a yeah. two two uh, roadside vendors selling. Uh, obviously one travels by bicycle. He's got it there. It looks like they're selling yeah. purses. I think that's what this is, handbags. Yeah. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. And the cars are smart. They look new yeah. and in good condition yeah. for a place that rains all the time. You'd expect them yeah. to be rusty. Yeah. Um, a typical scene of the Congo, you would you would find that everywhere. Uh, I don't think much has changed. They're still vending on the side of the streets. Mm -hmm. But those, those, the, and I remember because we had those, uh, we had some of these bags. And when we immigrated to South Africa, we had a few of them. And they lasted for years. They were really well handmade, but they were beautifully made and very decorative. If you go up uh, back to the bar yes. on the top of my mom's head, it's There's a, a painting there. Painting, okay. Yeah, it's a painting. Painting done by an African, what they call stick figures. Uh -huh. uh, that was all done by the Africans at that at that time and in that period. You, see, you would get a lot of that. Okay. So, yeah. Interesting. Let me slide down to the next yeah. one here. Um, oh, my goodness. There is a, a, a you know, for, 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 hang on a second. I got to put us all on the screen so we can just make, people can see our faces. Yeah. For those of you under the age of 1,000, um, this is uh, a device that today is replaced by something called an MP3 player. You can listen on your mobile. It weighs a couple of ounces. But you're going to see here, it looks like it's Nigel's mom dealing with something the size of an armored personnel carrier in order to generate music so we can hear it. This is like a massive hi-fi. And I think that the, the blue thing might have been a uh, LP player, a record player on top inside a case. How Am I correct? No, you unfortunately you're not. It's, oh. it's a real to real player. Oh, okay. Well, close enough. Okay, but it's 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 also for playing sound. Yeah. Okay. What what's interesting? Uh, the reason why I'm showing it is because uh, my dad was very much as a hobby into electronics, so he built that whole amplifier wow. on the radio. Wow. Um, so that was the hi-fi of those days. You know, Ronald Ronaldo Chaus with yes. his Technics turntable. You see. Yeah. Um, it's not that ancient. Um, However, the top part there where you see the brown part with the, those round knobs on it, mm -hmm. that was a, an, a, an amplifier that my dad had built. It was all valves in those days. They weren't sure. transistors. That's a tape recorder. I still have those reels. Wow. wow. I still have those reels with music on it, and I have reels with his voice on it still. Do you think I can find a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder? Oh, they're hard to I find. Can't have you, find have, have you they, ever been able to transfer that to digital in any way? No, I want to. That's the whole point. Because I've the, got because the mm, tape will degrade over time. You'll lose it. Yeah, um, we've got. Yeah, I've been very careful to look after those. All the all the slides that I've had from the Congo, they've all been digitized. Okay, um, good. They've been put away. Uh, we have 
tons and tons of eight millimeter super eight and standard eight film which we're busy now putting it onto um digital format Mm -hmm. um so yes and those so there's a whole lot of stuff in there as well which is very interesting but this is just an idea again we were let's be honest middle upper class Mm -hmm. we probably considered um wealthy because of the scenario and how we lived okay but that is a typical um, house that you would find amongst the Europeans in the Congo at that time. Now, folks, I, 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 I've got to let the cat out of the bag here. <clears throat> Nigel's not going to tell you this, but um, it, you see that there were some cables running to it. They're, they're really just stuck out the window. There was no power. And actually, uh, Nigel's inside that box. He's inside that box as a small child peddling to generate the electricity so his parents could listen to music. It's what we call child slave labor. So I don't know. Nigel, it's a painful memory for Nigel, so he didn't want to share that. Uh, but but we'll skip that part. But seriously, obviously you had electricity. How was your electricity supply? Was it reliable back then? Do you remember? We did have blackouts, yeah. from what I can remember, but it wasn't uh, as frequent as we get it now. Because I think it was more know. to do with and every yeah. hour is pretty frequent. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think it was more to do when we had storms because we used to get pretty heavy storms at some stage, mm-hmm. and it would uh, smack the lines and cause probably havoc and what have you. So yeah, I remember that. Now, Erica, your father was in accounting. Your mother was a nurse. Um, so were you guys, um, were you guys kind of hoi polloi, ritzy ritzy, like uh, Nigel's family was? Or were you just kind of middle class and uh, on on the white trash side that my family was? <laughs> no, middle class. Uh, um, middle class. Yeah, high middle class. Okay. All right. So did you guys have any of those high flute? I mean, by the way, that's pretty impressive. Uh, Nigel's dad built that thing. That's pretty cool. But I mean, that's back when we did stuff like that, right? You may, I used to build computers. Now I just go online and go, okay, put this in and put this in and put this in it. I can't be bothered with it. People can't be bothered anymore. So um, what was it like? Uh, did you guys have anything? Uh, was your family into photography or high fives or cars or anything like that? Because I mean, Nigel, his dad's in aviation. He builds stereos. He's got reel to reels. They're they're all big. They're techs. They're nerds before nerds were cool. <laughs> what about your family, Erica? Well, my father had a Mercedes. He had a black Mercedes, mm, okay. and um, and he drove that Mercedes. Uh, from uh, the Congo to um, South Africa, you know, after we had to leave as refugees. Mm-hmm. And I, my mom and my two brothers and I, we went, we came down um, by train and my dad followed afterwards. We didn't think he'd get out of love, but he did in the Mercedes. Wow. And so uh, at that particular time, there was only one other Mercedes in South Africa, a black Mercedes, exactly the same as my dad was a state president. So you can imagine, <laughs> we had fun. I'll bet. <laughs> because we went to Toria. <laughs> can I, get you, can I a... get you to move your mic again? Sorry, it's got that hollow sound again. Okay, sorry. There you Leave go. That's, that's so much better. Yeah. So so if I heard correctly, <laughs> sorry. your dad drove that Mercedes. He got out of Katanga and, and got to South Africa yes. in that Mercedes. And it was the only, yes. there's only one other Mercedes like that in all of South Africa at the time. Yes, the wow. state president. So wow. we, we had a lot of fun with that. <laughs> People probably thought the president was driving by every time they saw your dad. That's right, because you're in Pretoria. <laughs> well, yeah, especially in Pretoria. Yeah. Did the police snap to attention and salute? <laughs> we had no problems. Yes, we did get salutes. So oh, I, I would always crack up laughing. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Yikes. So Elizabeth in chat says, makes me want to scratch in my parents' photos, which I'm banned from because of previous theft accusations memories <laughs> well elizabeth you shouldn't be stealing photographs from your parents um now that my mother has passed i have a garage full of photographs from her lifetime which i'm about to sort through this week so nigel let's get back to the photographs here um this is an amazing photograph of your mom in a beautiful looking park i assume that's in uh in uh, leopoldville yeah that we didn't have robots in those days or traffic lights as you yep. call them we had roundabouts or traffic circles um and the upper was full of them, and that's how it looked at that time. They would take care of it, and you would drive around. Um, and that's mom, you like you said, my mom standing in the in the middle there. So that just gives you an idea of the roadworks and the scenery and the vegetation of that of that um, of that country. 
Now, you see that you see that palm tree there, that that tree I was referring to that's earlier the one on behind that us. Gives you the that's the one. Yeah, that's the one. So I mean, it's difficult to tell from the photos because I mean, uh, she's not around us tall, but it look, I get the impression your mother must be tall. Is, is that the case, or just no? Like, she was a midget. She was five oh. point. Wow, that's def, definitely an illusion. Then that's why I was asking. Yeah. Okay. No, she's right. she's very short. So now um, the next photo here we see it looks like fishing uh, made from reeds, fishing baskets. Is that what those are? Yep, that's exactly what it is in the Congo River. The Africans would uh, catch fish in that manner. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in some parts of the river where it really flows fast, they would put them out in the water. I have uh, there's two photos and you'll see some kids there, and you can see how rapid it gets in some areas. Uh, they would put those nets out and catch the fish in that in that manner, mm -hmm. and they still do it today. Yeah, yeah. And they work. They're, they're very good. effective. And they work. And they work. Yeah. Yep. And, and the kids were. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Go ahead. The kids were incredible in the water. They could swim. They would go underneath. They would come up. No fear of that water. And look at the speed. You can see the speed of that water. It's not slow. Well, and the kids used to go in there. Well, I, I don't have that picture up. I'm going to show that in just a moment. I just have the baskets right oh, now. Oh, sorry, sorry. No, that's no, okay. No. So people can't see that. They're probably like, what's he talking about? Um, but mm -hmm. Leo Vignansa von Rendsburg says, I still have a valve radio and would love to get it working, but can't find anyone to fix it. Yeah, that's a tough thing. Okay, here you go. Here's the water from the the Congo and his kids fishing. Look at that. Wow. Wow, folks. There's a bunch. I mean, it's a tiny little kid. Looks like he's about two tiny or three kids. years old. Yeah. 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 Crazy, crazy stuff. And um, let me move on to the next one here. Um, and this, uh, you look like you got later hosen on there next to, uh, it looks like a, a Peugeot or a Citroën, a Citroën, I think it is. No, um, it's a 2CV. Okay. And is that- De Chevaux. With, okay. Is that with your, uh, with your dad? Yeah, so earlier on I said that every six months you had to leave the Congo and do whatever you wanted to do. It's right. like a furlong, six months furlong. So what we used to do is we used to hire a car, which was a Dershiva, and we would tour the whole of Europe oh, cool. in the Dershiva. And this is one uh, one of the second last times we went, uh, um, did a tour. This was Italy, okay. as you can see by the grab we were wearing. So um, so that's, that is basically, so you can see I've grown up a little bit since that little baby portion. Uh -huh. um, and we would travel around in that little De Chavaux, all over Italy. We'd go to some fantastic places. Um, as you can see, if you if you scroll down a little bit further down, you'll see uh, we're at the Colosseum and we're at the... Um, uh, there you go. Uh, and a couple of places there, you'll see where we are. Um, You're looking distinctly blonde. I was blonde. I was blonde until about 15, 14, yeah, this, 15. What, what is that all about? I mean, I, I, was, I had blonde hair. And blue eyes um, until puberty, and then my hair got brown, and then when I got my thirties, it started turning not black, but almost. Black. What's that all about? I mean, that's hmm, interesting. Interesting. I yeah. guess the, the the hair just ex gets exposed, and I don't know turns, but yeah, yeah, you're looking distinctly yeah. blonde there. Uh, yeah. Looks like it's uh, either no, it's the same day. I mean, I, I don't. It's imagine... an idiot. Yeah. yeah, but this I don't... is in Italy. Yeah, I don't imagine wearing the same shirt for days on end. So it looks like it's the same day. You have the same shirt it's on. A, yeah. Yeah, yeah, same day. Yeah. Okay. So the the one is the the is I think it's called the Colosseum. Um, yes. In Rome, um, we've been there a few times. Uh, you know, I, it, to be frank, as a little child, you go, then you think oh, this is just a piece of scrap heap. It's just c'est cassé, ça marche pas, qu'est-ce qu'il y a avec ça? You know, c'est un problème. So, but anyway, so and I I never took a lot of interest about it, but now that the memories are coming back and. I actually have very fond memories of spending time with my mom and dad and looking at these places and thinking, you know, we, we really, we did have a pretty privileged life at that point in time. Yeah, no, it's quite lovely. I mean, you got to do these things. I, I as a child, mm -hmm. never got to travel or anything like this. It's quite interesting. You did. I, I traveled, mm -hmm. but we were running from bill collectors from state to state to avoid bill collectors. So it's not, <laughs> not quite the same sort of thing. So, you know, when, when you're, you know, slipping out in the middle of the night and you hear sirens as you cross mm -hmm. the state line and, you know, you're safe. But, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, no. So here's a picture of you. It looks like you got um, roller skates there, man. Those are from the yeah. twelve. Those are also from the twelve hundreds. Those roller skates. Yeah, they are. <laughs> um, when because we used to spend. My my grandparents lived in Brussels, mm -hmm. and what we used to like to go do when we were there on furlong is to go to Ostend, mm -hmm. yes. and Ostend has a piers and it's got these that's it. You're jetties on a, you're going on a, you're out on a pier right there on a like pier that. there. Yeah. 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 And I used to love roller skating, and that was just me at I don't know seven, eight, I guess. Yeah. Roller skating up and down, and they used to have these little three wheelers that you could sit on and pedal. And one of the things I really used to enjoy doing, because every time I go back, the, well, the last time I went back was quite a few years ago, 
was they used to have these little um, side road. Um, what do you call them? Anyway, don't want to waste time. Yeah. But you could buy you could buy little sh- you buy little shrimps that have been fried with fritos, and you would have that either with mustard or with uh, mayo. Making and you used to hungry. buy those. <laughs> yeah, and you used to buy and eat them on the pier. Fantastic Ooh. because they were fresh, fresh, yeah. fresh, fresh, fresh. Exactly. Because Ostend, Ostend is a fishing village. It's basically a fishing area um, where all the fishing sh- um, boats would come in and unload their their catch. And that's what I used to do in my holidays and fall off bicycles and break hands. <laughs> well, that's not so good. But uh, mm-hmm. So Abraham Janssen von Rendsburg asked if you knew Mike Beachyhead. I don't know what that is. Mike Beachyhead. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No. Name's not familiar. And then uh, Elizabeth is offering some kind of advice for Leo von Janssen von Rendsburg. He says, try Mars Tube Audio in Parle if you're near Cape Town. Okay, oh. to, to fix that, that tube radio. So that'd be cool. Okay. Mars mm-hmm. Tube Audio. Tube Parle. Uh, cool. Okay. Um, and then Lynn is uh, saying something about Erica's hair is the same, uh, still the same. <laughs> so, are the folks enjoying this? Um, I hope uh, well, the <laughs> audience has been consistent. I mean, you know, um, oh, we, mm. we've had uh, between seventy-five and eighty-five people the entire mm. ride so far. So, folks, you're listening oh, to Chris White Africa on the Adobe Africa channel here on YouTube on the fourth of January, twenty twenty-one, for my first my inaugural 2021 interview program. This is the first time I interview anybody this year. And my guests today are Nigel Soden and Erica Unwin, who've joined us uh, to talk about their experiences growing up in the Belgian Congo. That's right. No, we're not glorifying colonialism. We're not calling for a heyday. We don't harken back and wish for old days or days of yore. Now, this was an opportunity for me to showcase Nigel's 14th century technology, um, things he experienced growing up, like these roller skates and <laughs> his dad's massive hi-fi <laughs> and uh, these aircraft from another era. But no, it's a chance just to talk and reflect about uh, what it was like growing up in a different era, in a different time, in a very different place. And that's kind of what we're talking about. So thanks for tuning in. We're going to go for a little bit longer here, but um, we just looked at a lovely photograph of Nigel on a pier uh, with rollerblades. Now, before I bring the next photo up, which is, um, this one's pretty stunning. So before we do that, Nigel, um, I just want to ask Erica. Warn. Yeah, <laughs> I want to ask Erica. So when you think back to Elizabethville, um, what is the thing that you, you miss the most from that time? I mean, you were a little kid, so we miss different things uh, when, we're, when we're younger. But is there anything that stands out in your mind that you really, really miss? I mean, would you, would you, would you have liked to, that time to continue and have grown up in the Congo and, and not moved on? Or, or, or did, was there something special about it? I uh, missed our pets. You know, we had to leave them behind when we came through as refugees, my dog and cats and yes i also had a pet monkey and i had a tortoise um i just missed the wild the wildness of it because when we came to south africa we went to um first of all we went to pretoria where my grandparents were and then from there we went to johannesburg and i mean south africa culture hit me like a bomb i couldn't speak any of the languages um, picked up Africa's first, uh, but yeah, I miss the lifestyle, the freedom, and um, I miss my friends. I miss uh, John B so much. He was a lovely man, he really was, and um, yeah, it was a different lifestyle. Well, that's that's kind of what I figured. I expected that, that that's kind of what you'd say. Uh, a lot of really nice things coming in the chat right now, folks. Um, people enjoying this. Marauder says uh, thanks to Nigel and Erica. It's very interesting. Thank you. I'm a sucker for reminiscing. <laughs> now, <laughs> now this one I can't endorse, but Ron von Ryman and a couple other people are going on about the wonderful Citroens. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I can't. That one I can't endorse. <laughs> Citroen. No, absolute garbage automobile. Uh, now I'm going to get no, no. Gonna, so that Citroen duck. <laughs> What a they sad are. excuse for a car. What a sad excuse for a car. Going to get hate mail now. I'm sure it's coming. Going to be coming very shortly. But uh, yeah, so um, lots of folks are saying really nice things. Um, Keith was asking, can you ask Nigel if the tapes are three and a quarter or seven and a half inches per second? I think he's talking about the eight millimeter. I'm not sure. I don't know. That's a good question. Standard, well, no, he, he would be calling up stand, what they call standard eight. So yeah. those sprocket holes are different to super eight. Exactly. The quarter inch, but I don't know what speed they were at. Like, I think the quarter inch. Clem Malinarik says, great stream, guys. Really interesting. Well, that's cool. So now we're going to embarrass Nigel. Before, before oh, you okay, go. Okay, okay, okay go uh, Before you go, I'd, I'd like to correct a misconception about 
un citron. Oh, dear God. Okay. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, we're having trouble with Nigel's connection. If he drops off, don't pay any attention to that. <laughs> When you drive in Europe in those days, mm -hmm. specifically yes. Italy or even Belgium, and you, you have these little cobblestone roads, mm -hmm. you do not feel a thing when you drive in a deux chevaux. It's as smooth as a baby's whatever. Bum. <laughs> now, yeah. <laughs> and the, the only car that could duplicate that kind of ride was the Citroen again, which was, what did they call it? The D9, I think they called it in those days. You know, that long, that long one where you pop, pop a tire and then you can still drive on three tires, you know, on three, on three wheels. <laughs> this, this little Dusheva was exactly the same. The only problem with this car is that it was a three-cylinder, if I can remember. It was a 900cc. It was two strokes, so it smoked like hell sometimes. Oh. And when you hit a hill, it would puke all over the road because it just looked at it and thought, I'm not going to make this at all. You know? So <laughs> I'll grant you that piece. But for the rest, nah, nah. <laughs> You may continue. Well, thank you so much for that. That brief interlude, this advertisement for piss poor French Citron. automobile production. Citroën, yeah, that's right. Uh, Peugeot and Citroën. Uh, even the very names are difficult to uh, stomach. No, just kidding. Just give them the French a hard time, folks. Just give them a hard time. The Duck is actually a beloved. The Duck is a beloved vehicle. People absolutely love it. They cherish it. They I don't know why, but they really do. Uh, so now we're going to embarrass Nigel with um, – this is a photograph from Life Magazine and Vogue. And I think it was in uh, Gentleman's Quarterly back in the day. So we're going to show you this photograph here. You guys ready for this? Check it out. Look at James Bond right there. Look at that pose. Striking a pose with that lovely um, lime green sort of uh, blazer and a turtleneck. Wow, look at that. Where's this at, Nigel? Okay, this is 1972, uh, 72, 73, just before I met my wife. Uh -huh. um, I, I was approached by some agent and asked if I would do some uh, modeling. Uh -huh. um, and I said, yeah, wait, sure. Wait, 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 wait a second. Wait a second. Hang on a second, Nigel. Why, you, why did you pause like that? You made us like think like he's going, I was approached to do some uh, some movies, some uh, like you were going to no. do in porn or something. Let's, I mean, let's, just let's, let's move on. Oh, <laughs> just oh, oh we've, uncovered, we've discovered something here. <laughs> Folks, this was a family program. Send your children home now. Mm. <laughs> anyway, mm. go ahead, Nigel. But the reason why I put that photograph is to show you that nothing has changed today. You know, you look at this and say, well, you can see it's a vintage photograph. Yes. Right? But if you look at the jacket, that green, when the reason why I put it there is because the, the, the next photographs will explain it, is that that green jacket was given to me after we had done that whole session. But there was one proviso, is, proviso that I had long, long, long hair in those days. Uh, and, I, and for the folks who are over 40, 50, you, you remember there was a – there was a, a boy by the name of David Cassidy in that time. <laughs> yeah. And he had this long, long hair. Well, I had long hair like that, and I had it and I had it the same style as this, but I was asked to cut it short for this photo session. So I said, okay, fine. And if I did that, they would give me that jacket, which I did. I got it. When I met my wife on a blind date, I was wearing that jacket. And her first thought was not that he's a good looking bugger or that he's handsome. She went, Ugh, that jacket. Come on, go on. I'm not going to go out with that man. <laughs> so that's the story of that picture. Uh, uh, not the modeling part, nothing. Okay. So there's another photograph where Swift was going on. The next one here looks like somebody's playing guitar. Um, where's this at? This, this is, again, this was up in Joburg. Um, these, these are a staff member of my dad. My dad worked for a company in Boxburg. And I was invited to go and play guitar there. So this is the era. Um, what, I'm, what I'm just trying to show is the continuity of things that we did in the Congo with the music, et cetera, et cetera. How, how though we live in a different era, but things don't really change. We, yeah. we do the same thing, electronics, flying, photography. It's just the technology is different, but the, uh, the, the hobbies are the same. Nothing's changed much. The tools change, but the human interaction mm. remains consistent, mm. and that gets mm. lost on people. Mm. You know, it, it may be um, PlayStation and PCs and Xboxes mm. today, but it was Atari and Pong 30, 40 mm. years, 40 years mm. ago. And before mm. that, it was different technology, that sort of thing. Mm. Now, I will say this, that you, you, you seem to have adapted well from the Belgian Congo, and you've pretty much become a Borki there because, I mean, you seem to be incapable of wearing shoes. You're barefoot in this photograph. 
I never wore shoes. I never wore shoes in the Just Congo. Just like an Afrikaner. Wow. <laughs> when I, you know, when I, when I went to, when I was sent to a private school, the public school in England, up in Yorkshire, uh-huh. uh, I would bought me a uniform, and they presented me with these two black objects, and uh-huh. I thought, what the hell must I do with this? And they said, you will wear them. You are not in the Congo anymore. <laughs> wear them i couldn't wear these shoes it was just terrible so i would wear them go and have breakfast and when i went to class i would take them off and walk when i holding in my hand you know and then i would put them under my desk and in those days you wrote with a quill do you know the quill with a little pen yeah, on it and yeah. you would dip your quill in the ink in your little angled desk made out of wood and you were right there and for, for unfortunately i had a broken arm at that time so i had to write left-handed but I was fortunate because I was ambidextrous. The problem was, as I wrote, everything got smudged. Yes, because... So I'd look at this and I thought, what the hell? You know? As a left-handed person, I'm quite well acquainted with the yeah, uh, bigotry against left-handed people, the way that mm-hmm. writing things are designed. Mm-hmm. But uh, <laughs> So, so they, I, they, I, I'm going to have mm-hmm. to say this, Nigel. Um, listen, uh, broken hand, broken arm. I think that you're probably a disaster to hang around with. You're probably an unsafe person to hang out with. So um, if, 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 if Giselle decides to go skydiving again, I'll suggest she take you. I'm not going. You think I'm bad? You must see my youngest son <laughs> falling off a motorbike. He's got pins all over him. He oh fell down goodness. a castle and broke his arm. I don't know how many times. So he's taken after me, but he's got more. Anyway, <laughs> let's continue. Yeah. So this next photograph here, um, let's see, before we get to that, uh, Fawn says Oxford pants. Uh, good one there. And Nigel's, or no, Hendel, Hendel says that Nigel sounds like a French car salesman. I thought so too, but just anyway. But, um, and then uh, here's another photograph. This is a lovely lady. I want, I want to know what his name is, please. I shall sell him a good second name car. That doesn't sound like a French car salesman. It sounds more like a, it sounds more like hello, a, hello. Uh, Attend. Uh, oh, tell me the go. name of this Frenchman. Huh? Uh, this go. man. That's better. Hmm? <laughs> I will put my dog onto him. <laughs> All right. So here's a photograph. Looks like it's in a pub or restaurant in a booth mm-hmm. and with a red shirt on. And is that your wife or? That's my wife. 1972. Wow. Uh, and she's smiling despite the green jacket. That's impressive. Well, she had destroyed it by then. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was banned from wearing it. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. The, if, if, you know, we, we have a saying, we all know this, when you marry, when you meet a woman, mm-hmm. you, I, uh, it's just unusual. Well, that you can't see in this photograph, because if you look at my wife and you look at my mom, they're very similar. And you always seem to marry somebody that's very similar to your mother. And I know that sounds strange, but so I've put it in there because and I couldn't find one of my mom. But this was in Belgium on honeymoon in 1976. Mm-hmm. Uh, we got married. And then two years later, I took her on honeymoon. So this is one in those little pubs in, in Brussels where you would go at the back of La Grand Place. They've got all these um, restaurants where the locals go and we'd go and have escargots and um, uh, what do you mean? Ugh. Ugh, uh, escargots, <laughs> not ugh. Um, <laughs> no, so and I took no, it. We went all exact, over the place. Exact. Ugh. <laughs> ugh. Uh, how can he? How is it that he, he can say ugh, but he can't say Ronaldo Chos? I do say or, Ronaldo Chos. <laughs> oh, then you got it. You got it. You see, but okay. I don't. I don't often keep spare phlegm in the back of my throat just to pronounce oh. his name. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's my wife in 1972. Okay. Unfortunately, she's not well at the moment. Um, sorry to hear that. No, just that's how it is. But a uh, wonderful lady. We've been married for 46, 45 years now. Wow. So see, the, the green jacket wow, didn't do amazing. any harm. It didn't do any harm. Um, yeah. Yep. So let me see. Uh, I, oh, hang on a second. I just lost where I was at there. So this is the next photograph. Um, this mm. is, um, it looks like a sort of white dress. Um, and what's yeah. this one? This is taken in Greece. Okay. Um, but if you look at her style and you look at my mom in the previous pictures, you almost see the same clothes. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Some reminiscence. So it's it, nothing changes much because fashion just repeat themselves after so many years. You know? Yeah, they, things so come I, back. I, yeah, I put that in there because it's as 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 a means of continuity, how, how things continue, but in a different time, in a different uh, space of time. Um, yeah, uh, there's a nice story behind that, but I think we're running out of time, so I'll skip that one. Well, so we can go to the we'll last start with the last one here, the last photograph here mm. that we have. This is um, an awesome looking plane, mm. and I can't tell where this is. That could be anywhere in the high belt or somewhere in southern Africa, but uh, yeah. it's pretty cool looking. The one behind it's even yeah. more impressive. Looks like it might, I don't yeah. know, it might be a, a Lear. I don't know what this one in the front is, but um, no, the, tell this, us about this picture. 
This one in the front is a, a Piper Tri-Pacer. Okay, um, Piper, okay. Yeah, 135 horsepower. That's my wife standing under the wing there. Okay. The, again, this continuity. My dad came out of the Navy. I went into the Navy. My dad was in aviation. I got involved in aviation. After aviation, I got involved in hi-fis, uh, top-end hi-fis. So there's that continuity within the family. The interesting thing about this particular airplane is that it came out the factory floor on the same day that I was born. No way. Exactly That's... the same day when I was wow. born. Wow, wow. So and I you... got my license on that airplane. Okay, but you got on that plane. You didn't. You didn't own this plane. Though. No, we owned it. No, we owned it. Oh, you did own it. Wow, that's incre it, that's yeah. incredible. Wow. Yeah. Uh, is it is it in the, the dust be a dustbin of history now, or is it still around? Oh no, it's. I don't know actually. I haven't checked. Um, I haven't checked if it still exists. It probably does somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I put it in there just to show continuity and how extraordinary it is that it actually came out the factory on the same day that I was born. And what what, what airfield is this? Did you say? This is Benoni Brackpan Airfield, oh, okay. Brackman, 1975, 76. Yeah, and the airplane behind it is a Piper Seneca. Oh, okay, Seneca. That's why it looked yeah. familiar. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, Pipers are made right here in Pennsylvania. Then they eventually mm -hmm. the company was relocated to Florida. Um, but there's a there's a Piper Museum here in Pennsylvania. Um, I've been there. It's pretty pretty cool. Oh, okay. um, it sits in an airfield up in the center of Pennsylvania, just west mm -hmm. of Williamsport, about half an hour, forty minutes from there. Quite pretty, mm -hmm. quite awesome. They've got a good collection of stuff, an amazing collection. The building sucks. It's it's an old you know the operations building um, mm -hmm. with the hangars and the maintenance bays in the back, and they turned into a museum. Uh, somebody needs to come up with like three or four million dollars to build a proper you know modern building because the the things they have inside it warrant a proper museum. Mm -hmm. uh, Piper is amazing. Um, you know, Piper Cub, oh, oh man, that is a classic aircraft for mm -hmm. firefighting, for reconnaissance, for all sorts of things. Piper's amazing. So Erica, when when you guys moved Ooh. when you guys moved from move moved as you, know, you fled as refugees. Moved, moved Yeah, yeah. When when you fled as refugees from <laughs> from the Congo, from Katanga to South Africa and you had to leave all your pets behind. Sounds like you had a zoo there, a tortoise and a monkey and yeah. all kinds of other things. When you left all that behind, um, did you at the time, and this is a question for people who, for refugees, and I, I know a number of people in my lifetime, particularly from Europe, who were refugees from the Second World War and such, mm -hmm. but also people from the Middle East who've been refugees. Uh, did you think or expect that you'd be going back? I mean, uh, in Europe, a lot of people thought, well, once the war's over and everything's settled, we'll just go home. That's what people do after war. You leave for a while, then you come back. But the modern situation refugees is it, they never go home, but you can't go home. It's not safe. So as a little kid at the time, did you think, well, we'll be coming back? Or did you, at some point you realize that's it? I'm never going back to the Katanga. No, we knew we weren't going to go back because um, all, uh, between the time we left, my mom and my two brothers and I, and, and with my dad finally arrived, things exploded. Mm -hmm. And I remember my parents and my grandparents listening to the radio every day. And my mother was crying at times as well. And I didn't think I'd see my dad alive. I'll never forget the day when I did see him driving up the road, you know, in the black Mercedes. It was the most amazing day of my life. I just, um, but then there was talk that um, we would go back to Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And um, but my dad was offered a job. His first job was with um, Total, and then he, from there he went to CNA. He was in charge of South Africa, all the books and things like that. And then after that, we went to Dundee. But um, we never, we knew we would never go back. Mm. Yeah, no, that that's got to be that's got to be tough because that's what you know. You're just a little kid. That's mm. your whole world. That you know. For me, um, I was never a refugee, but but certainly moved a lot, and so I was constantly accustomed to picking up and moving every few months or to somewhere else. Being new, being skinny, being the the new person on the outside all the time was always on the outside. So. Um, that's all part of it too. I mean, you, you're, you're on the outside, you don't speak the languages that these people around you speak mm -hmm. and, and you've got to adjust and, and, and figure things out for a kid. Kids are adaptable. We learn quickly. We learn languages, but, mm -hmm. but the constant changing or the big change like that's gotta be difficult. So, uh, but you had a pet monkey. I didn't know that. That's fascinating to hear about. So. <laughs> well, so the natural. No, I think it was common. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not surprised. I I mean, it was pretty, yeah. Pretty common yeah. then. Yeah. Chris. Yeah. Um, if, if I can just share one little story, sure. and an incident that happened in the Congo, which is quite hilarious. Um, we used to drive around in Jaguars, 
in, in those days. And then my dad decided, you know what, let's get an American car. So they bought the Studebaker, really 1968, no, 66 Studebaker. Mm -hmm. No, 1958 Studebaker. Mm -hmm. And it was imported. And, um, and he always had cameras and 35 mil uh, canisters with him all over the place and got in the car and we drove. And then one day he got in the car and he heard this rattling. And he tried to find the damn rattle and he couldn't find it. And this went on for about three months and eventually he just got fed up. He took the car back to the mm. agents and he said, look, there's a rattle in this car and it's just driving me dilly. So anyway, they, they drove around it and they heard the rattle. They said, fine, okay. And none of them could find what the rattle was. Eventually they said, okay, fine, we'll get you, we'll import another one for you, which they did. And you got that one and it was perfect. About, a, about six months later after he got his second one, The dealer found him and said, uh, Mr. Soden, are you short of a 35 mil film canister? We found the source <laughs> of your record. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the canisters were tin. They were metal. They weren't plastic. Yeah, and of course, later, yeah. when, my, growing, when I grew up, I mean, those were all plastic containers. But back in those days, it were all metal or tin. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Listen, folks, come on, smash the like button. 81 people watching the program right now. We got 84 likes. Although I suspect most people that are here probably already liked it. But if you haven't, please smash the like button. There you go. There's one more uh, before we close out this stream. Wow. Um, that, that, that is a funny story. Thanks for sharing that. Well, guys, um, this is uh, it's been fascinating, I think, for the audience. I've enjoyed it as well. Um, thanks, Nigel, for digging up those photographs. It just reminds me of the task I have waiting for me with my mother's photographs. Mm -hmm. So much to do with digitizing those and getting them ready for my family members so they can see them. That's going to be a lot of work. Um, Ron says, Studebaker Jags. Interesting. Yeah. No, that is interesting to see that a Studebaker was in the Congo. That's pretty fascinating to see that that actually happened. But, um, yeah, when you think of Africa, you don't think of American-made cars. <laughs> you, know, you just don't, don't think of them. You don't think of them at all. Uh, you definitely think of, of uh, European cars back in the day and for the last 20 or 30 years, Japanese cars. That's what you expect. Toyotas all over the place, things like that. Maybe some BMWs, some Audis in South Africa, Mercedes occasionally. Mm -hmm. But, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, there were a lot of Jeeps there. A lot of Jeeps and there? Chevy trucks. Oh, yeah, there? Okay. and when... There, there was a crowd that used to catch animals. I don't know if you remember the film called Hatari. Yeah, yeah, that's a John Wayne movie. It's his only yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. Those vehicles. Those vehicles. Was, I had a friend who was involved in that. That and, was filmed uh, in Arusha in Tanzania. Mm, yeah, mm, yeah. Mm. yeah, Hatari. And it was Tanganyika then because I don't think it had become independent yet. I'm trying to remember the year. I think it was 58 or 59. Maybe it was 60. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And every time I watched it, I cried my eyes out. Why did you and cry? You miss it. You, you missed oh, you missed for the, for the okay yeah you okay, yeah I got you okay um yeah no I actually enjoyed it that was a pretty good film by John Wayne I mean it it's, it doesn't get a lot of credit for you know but I mean it's, it's pretty good uh Hatari yeah no that was a good movie so uh, yeah guys um any uh last thoughts Erica uh, on the Congo Belgian Congo growing up anything you want to share with anybody because um you know uh, what we're doing right here honestly folks this is recording history right here I mean it's uh It's like I always tell people, uh, now this doesn't apply to you guys, so don't, this is not, but I'm just saying, a lot of people, because I'm a genealogist, are like, yeah, I, gosh, I wish I talked to my parents and my grandparents when I was mm. younger to hear stories about, you know, growing up and where they're at. Uh, and that's what I always tell people who are into genealogy. If you have parents, you have grandparents, you have people that did something interesting, or even if you don't think it's interesting, and you're interested in genealogy or family history, go talk to them, record an audio interview with them, save those digits so you have their voice and hear their stories and uh, understand that we're all storytellers and uh, probably a little piece of all our stories are just nonsense, but uh, most of them are true. So, but capture those things because if you don't, you'll regret it later on. And if you yeah. have kids and grandkids, um, you'll regret not saving those things for them. So <laughs> I think what we've done here a little bit today is, is capture for posterity a little bit of both of your experiences growing up in different parts of the Belgian Congo in a very different time, in a very different era. So any last thoughts, Erica? And then I'll go to Nigel. I don't regret um, spending those uh, years in the Congo in the beginning. I learned so much. Chombi taught me so much um, as well. Him and his family. Um, I learned about their culture. I was one of the family and uh, could interpret the jungle drums and all that. And I think It's made me into a different person. My story isn't the same as everybody, as most people, and I, I don't regret it. It's just memories that are very special to me. Cool beans. Well, thank you for that, Erica. Nigel, any closing thoughts? Yeah, you know, one of the lessons 
I, the, the most impressionable years of, of a man's life or a person's life is when they're young kids from you know zero to 13 or 10. One of the things that really makes me angry today is, is that there's such a divide amongst people that it, all this nonsense that's going on today is actually unnecessary. All we've got to do is sit, sit around the table, talk, because we all come from different backgrounds. Mm-hmm. Um, but these, you know, what happens is that these other, this other narrative comes in and destroys the history of all people, not just one group of people, but all people. And the lesson that I learned from the Congo as growing up is that I'm not unique. I'm just a small little cog in this grand scheme of humanity and that we should really just, and I know it's impossible. It's an impossible task. You just talk to your neighbors and talk to other cultures and what have you. You know, I have nothing against anybody. I just hate it when they come with that narrative and because I, I can't stand it because I come from Africa and I grew up there. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I, so, and I don't want to get into politics. I don't want to get into that. But I do not class myself as a European. Mm-hmm. I'm not European-minded. I'm African-minded. Okay, mm-hmm. and I, I hope for the future for all of us is that we can we can escape any form of violence and and the stuff that happened in the rest of Africa. And it doesn't look like it. But anyway, yes. So my time in the Congo, brilliant. Wouldn't have changed it. Would I go back? Don't know. Don't know. Remember the heat and humidity, mosquitoes. Yeah, they, have, they yeah, haven't left. Yeah. That's still there. So keep yeah. <laughs> yeah. tolerable when you're six, not so tolerable when you're sixty six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but uh so uh Keith Alderson said uh oh no, I'm sorry, no, Leo Vignanza von Rendsburg says, uh my father when he retired went to all his siblings and scanned in every photo it could, gave all the kids a DVD. So awesome to have. Yeah, exactly. That's the advice I'm giving people now. So, Nigel, you, your kids, if you've got grandkids, they ought to be listening to you and, 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 and talking to you and hearing stories of growing up there so that those things continue. It's the same it's my, and my Yeah, it's my eldest son that got onto recording and archiving my folks' history and my history. Brilliant. So they, so they know they can go back when, because I've got two grandkids, so they can pass on the story to their kids. That's and awesome. there's that continuity, so they know our history. Now, just one very important question. The son in archive, is that the one that keeps breaking things, is it? No, no, this is no, 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 this is my oldest one. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I'm actually bay. I'm I'm house sitting at the moment. It's his house. He's down in the Cape. He's taken his family down there for a weekend, a week or something. So I'm at his house at the moment. So that's where I am. Gotcha. Keith says, guys, negotiate getting a few photos while your family's alive, or get copies as and when you can. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, for some strange reason, threw most photos away while. Uh, before she died and that's an important uh, point folks because a mm-hmm. lot of photographs people never put dates and places and people's names on the back of them so you're if, if you don't know these people because they were a generation removed or they were cousins then you're lost to describe who they are and then and then that that's just such a shame so it's important to capture that stuff uh what i'd like to say now oh, go ahead, chris Andrew. yeah good so, sorry just quick point do it because out of that well something will happen which happened to us about a year ago is i discovered i had another family in australia purely by archiving the photographs and making inquiries and showing photographs to people that had been in that era that somebody phoned me from america and said are you so and so of so and so and i said yes he said do you know that you have another family in australia Wow. So you never know what's going to come out of it. That's another story we can share sometime. Absolutely. And last night I was doing genealogy while I was uh, mm. watching uh, Gordon Ramsay's Kitchen Nightmares. I was multitasking and doing genealogy and I uh, discovered uh, a whole parcel of first cousins uh, on my maternal side whom I never knew mm. even existed by going mm. back and, and finding mm. documents. And so now I've got more cousins to find out about. But so uh, we're at 98 likes, so close to that triple figures, 98 likes. And, two uh, more. Let me, yeah, two more. Let me say this. Two folks. more. Come on, guys. Two I more. Want, I want to thank both my guests, uh, Erica and Nigel, for joining us and sharing their experiences growing up in the Belgian Congo in two very different locations, but apparently with the same damn weather, but uh, two very different locations. Sure. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I guess you couldn't get away from the rain no matter where you go in the Congo. But thanks a lot for that. And uh, just to let people know, uh, there will be a Night Owls edition today. Uh, but in the meantime, once I get off here, I'll be doing an unannounced live stream, a short one. Uh, 15 to, well, uh, probably 30 minute long live stream. It's going to overlap with Ronaldo's program. So uh, my apologies to folks that want to watch both. You don't have to come watch mine live if you don't want to. You can watch it after the fact. The reason I'm doing a live stream is because I'm going to put up a video uh, that was put together. It was just released today from Epic Times about 
fraud in Pennsylvania. And as I play the video, I'm going to have myself on the screen. I'm going to pause it and offer analysis about this new video talking about uh, 400,000 votes stolen from Donald Trump, supposedly, purportedly. So I'm going to do that live stream, which was unannounced. So if you want to catch that, you're welcome to join us for that. Uh, and that'll be shortly, probably within the next 15 minutes after I go off air. And I'll do it for probably 30 minutes or less. And then we'll do the Night Owls edition. But anyway, so again, many thanks to Nigel and to Erica. I uh, really appreciate you guys being on here. It just goes to show that um, people make assumptions about how people look and based on their appearance. Um, so if people look at you guys in Africa, they go, oh, look, Europeans uh, or oh, look, white folks. But um, you both uh, grew up in the Congo, but in very different circumstances. I mean, uh, Nigel's dad is, is English and mom is a Walloon and Erica's uh, mom. Wait, which one's one of them is from Switzerland and one of them. Is, I'm My dad the, is from Switzerland. OK, your dad is from Switzerland. Your mom is from Belgium, right? That's it. Yeah. All right. So there you go. And uh, and and you grew up in different parts of Congo and you wound up in South Africa and neither one of you could speak the damn language you got there. And, and poor Nigel didn't, yeah. didn't even know how to wear shoes when he arrived. That's how bad things were. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so uh, Olaf says, fantastic stream. Love the history and get to know the Congo through others' eyes and experience. Well, there you go, folks. We're going to end it here. I'll ask both my guests uh, to head off the screen and I'll wrap up. And thank you guys so much for this experience today. I really enjoyed it. And I think the audience got a lot out of it. By the way, we hit 101 likes. So bye bye, donkey. Qui a le bois? Merci, me voir. C'est très gentil de tous les gens. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot, Merci guys. Merci beaucoup. You're welcome. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Salut, mes amis. Salut. All right. There you go, folks. Um, let's get them. Uh, uh, Nigel's blushing, but I think the reason Nigel should blush is that 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 model photo. That was that was impressive. He was kind of, he was kind of hot looking. I mean, the lime green jacket aside, you know, he's a good looking oak. <laughs> All right, guys, I'll let you drop okay. off and then I'll, I'll wrap up. So go ahead and wait. Okay. okay. And just in case they can't get there on their own, I'll help them get there. Okay. Uh, that's not what I wanted. What's not happening here? Erica, you're still on the screen. I'm going to put you in it. The... There you go. All right. So what's going on here? All right, folks, thanks a lot for tuning in. I really appreciate the support for the channel. Awesome. We got over 100 likes for this view. This was pretty cool. Uh, first interview of 2021. We started off right here with uh, Nigel and Erica talking and reminiscing about their experiences growing up in the Belgian Congo. I hope you enjoyed it and learned a lot from it. Uh, thanks, Nigel, for the photographs. Uh, Erica, thank you and Nigel for sharing your experiences growing up and uh, what it was like. Uh, the Belgian Congo was a very different time. A lot of people will um, tell different parts of history and particularly those who didn't experience it. So it's nice to get firsthand, first person, primary source accounts of growing up in the Belgian Congo. Thanks a lot, folks. Again, I will be back on the air shortly and I'll be showing a video that was published by Epic Times today about vote theft in Pennsylvania. And this is new votes we haven't heard talked about before. This is all uh, has to do with uh, with the uh, with the counties reporting votes and and actual votes numbers being taken away from Donald Trump. So new evidence of more fraud. And so that'll be a live stream coming up shortly, unannounced. If you can join me, you're welcome to join me. Uh, and uh, it'll be me discussing this playing the video. So there you go. Uh, this was pretty cool. I enjoyed this one. I'll make sure I archive this video after the fact because it was pretty interesting. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And I want to thank everybody for tuning in. And with that, we're going to close it out here. And uh, uh, and you guys can catch me shortly. And again, there will be a Night Owls edition tonight if you want to tune in for that. We'll cover the news of the day. So thanks a lot, folks. God bless. And we'll catch you here shortly on Chris White Africa for a update on the 2020 elections, assuming YouTube doesn't cut me off. <laughs>